He'll do anything to be different. Most of you who saw the last series of Nice Time will have seen the debut of the Nice Time Musical Soars Orchestra. Well, we've had millions of letters to bring them back, so here they are. saw the conductor in half. Next week, we want musical teeth. So open wide, and if you can play a fandango on your fangs, write to us, not later than first post Tuesday, to Nice Time, Granada Telly, Manchester 3. And now, for the first time on European television, we present... Hey, what? Kenny. What? Jonathan wants to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Go mm -hmm. on, whisper it, then. How dare you say such a thing to a delicate performer? What do you see in a naked woman? Oh, everything. Great. Fantastic. Everything. <laughs> Nothing, really. No. <laughs> naked women? Oh, I like them very much. <laughs> oh, I've gone past that stage now. <laughs> Never seen one. Round in the right places. Hmm? The figure. What do you see in a naked woman? Uh, plenty. We like to have them. <laughs> well, for fat men, yeah. For a good shape. Yeah. More pear shape as well. Yeah. A bit of talent, you know. What interests you in naked men? Oh, nothing. <laughs> naked men. Oh! <laughs> oh! The airy men that love to be knitted. <laughs> Lovely muscles. I like men with muscles. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I've never seen one naked anyway. <laughs> no, I don't like a naked man. <laughs> Sex. <laughs> hey! It's John Willie. <laughs> Who? <laughs> and now, round the board with W. Leonard, the darts champ. You should see him throw him blindfold. He's terrible. And now here's somebody singing with his supper. I want to do something for me which requires great concentration and great coordination. I want you to sing Where Will the Baby's Dimple Be, eating this banana as fast as you can. Oh. <laughs> 
Og VS'en Så vi tager Til vi sind Lævede en forbi Unge vej, fint i forbi Unge vej, fint i forbi Unge vej, fint i forbi I don't know where mine is. In our first series, we asked you to invent musical instruments. We got a marvelous selection. For example. That was the musical boot, runner-up in the soul section. But our two prize winners were Tessa Heenan with the harmonious bicycle wheel and Frank Dixon with the electronic nail file. <laughs> Tessa, how did you discover that you could make music on a bicycle wheel? Well, I was just cleaning my bike and I noticed that you could get different notes on the spokes. So. Do you ever get tired playing it? No. Sorry I spoke. When did you discover the principle of the musical nail file? Um, oh, in my bath, like all the great principles. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> now, Tessa's going to play for you Pop Goes the Weasel. Sock it to me, baby! <laughs> are itching to give you the Harry Lime theme on the nail file. Take it away, Frank! You can make music with almost anything nowadays. Why don't you go to bed tonight and try some sheet music? Oh. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Next week, we're going to choose the man in Britain with the longest beard. So if you can tickle your toes by woggling your chin, write to us not later than first post Tuesday to Granada Telly, Manchester 3. Put nice time on the top. Ha what? Oh, of course. You may enter too, ladies. <laughs> time for nice time, half time. So sit back and imagine 200 beautiful girls dancing on the hearth rug. And now... Yes, I had a king-size inferiority complex with this, uh, this boy because uh, he could do everything better than I could. But I always thought that I could sing better than he could until he decided to enter in one of our local Eisted Vodai. 
and just walloped the pants off me. I, I just went to pieces w when he was around. And it took me a few years to realize that this was a, a, a genius and somebody just super Jenkins, not just an ordinary Jenkins like myself. Mr. Jenkins is, incidentally, the brother-in-law of Elizabeth Taylor. No, my muy pusig for more than vrau di Richard Burton. Or, if he puts it, the uh, brother of Richard Burton. If we could just conduct the rest of this interview in English, <laughs> if you don't mind. Okay. So, do you see um, much of Richard Burton these days? A fair amount. Um, we uh, have to go and see him these days because he's such a busy man, and uh, uh, we often go to see him in London. And when you say uh, we, you mean the whole vast family? Well, last year, the whole family, and I'm one of 11 brothers and sisters, unfortunately, just 10 of us at the moment, uh, and we were invited to the Dorchester. Uh, we almost took over a floor there, you know, uh, on the seventh floor. We almost had it to ourselves, so to speak. This was a sort of uh, exodus from Wales to London then. How did you get on on the journey? Not, not just uh, from Wales, but from all parts of the Principality. But I must tell you this great story. You've got to realize that uh, I'm from a working class background. My father was a coal miner. And uh, the elder members of my family never had the opportunity that possibly Richard and I had. And consequently, going up on the train, my eldest brother, Tom, sort of lectured the family and said, uh, just because you're having everything for free and for nothing, and not to spend your brother's money like a lot of banshees. You know. <laughs> what, what do the villagers say when he suddenly comes amongst them? Well, there's a, one of our villagers, he, he's a great character, well over 70, and. Uh, he never refers to Richard as Richard. He says, uh, how are you, Douglas Fairbanks? How are things going? <coughs> Is Elizabeth Taylor called Mary Pickford as well? <laughs> no, he, he just calls her Kettles, I think. How do you and the rest of the family find Elizabeth Taylor? Oh, we, we think she's uh, uh, a very ordinary, extraordinary person. Um, extreme beauty. Uh, she's a very delightful person to be with all the time. Very honest. Wouldn't tell a lie to save her life, I don't think. Uh, I have a feeling that um, Richard, being a brother of mine, have lived with him and so on, that uh, you accept him, although he's one of the top actors in the world. But with Elizabeth, I, I feel that she's uh, something different. I feel she's from another planet, you know. She looks so beautiful first thing in the morning, which is... Uh, I better not say too much about this, or my wife would crown me, perhaps. <laughs> you said too much, Jenkins. Get crowning, Mrs. J. And now... <laughs> Tea time, and it's a nice time to pick a vicar. All these men may appear to be white-collar workers, but only two of them are real vicars. Spot the vicars and write in with their numbers. <laughs> entry open will win the Pick a Vicar Prize, afternoon tea with Bishop Bill Mervyn. All entries to us at Nice Time, Granada Television, Manchester 3. Employees of the Church of England are not eligible for entry in this competition. And now for a poem. Jonathan's baby is made out of iron. Its head is as hard as a rock. Its name is Felicity, full of electricity. Wash it, you'll get quite a shock. Have you had any experience with electricity? No, no, no. Oh, you've got two, no, no, new, no. two new experiences coming right away. Um, now, put the baby on your lap. And there's one thing when you wash a baby, you have to hold its left hand very firmly with your left hand. Let's just make it comfortable for you. Now, I want you to cover it with foam with this, and I want you to try and do it for one whole minute. For how long? For one whole minute. All right. Now, we're starting. All right. Fifteen. Going straight to basics. <laughs> Hold it.
<laughs> a bit more foam, perhaps. Help, I hear. <laughs> uh, the What's the matter? Hey? What's the matter? It's a live baby, is this? <laughs> <laughs> God, oh, man. More foam. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> oh. Hold it, hold it. Hold it tight. More foam. <laughs> Come down a little bit, guys. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> More foam. Why do you keep saying ooh? ooh. <laughs> <laughs> or something. <I'm... laughs> uh, um... No, I said bath for baby, yeah, sir. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you were dancing. <laughs> For a nosy parker, it's an interesting job. Now it's a job that just suits me. A window cleaner you would be if you can see what I can see when I'm cleaning windows. Mr. Thornley? Yes. You are a window cleaner, aren't you? That's correct. Have you ever had any experiences like the ones that George Formby describes? Yes. Um, uh, one that I recall was uh, a young couple got married and had the contract to clean the place and just after they got married and I thought they were on honeymoon and uh, I went along to clean it and I got on the upstairs and unfortunately when I got there they were uh, they were having a loving which caused a tremendous scramble in the bedroom which if they'd have stayed as they were I most probably never noticed with the light shining into the room from outside it's, uh, did you never... become a window cleaner because of things like this no no. How long have you been a window cleaner? Um, say about seven years. And why do you keep it up? It's a job, it's money, and it has pleasures that uh, <laughs> go against the disadvantage. Well, the disadvantages are getting wet, I suppose, and things like that. This is it, yeah. What is the funniest thing that ever happened to you? The funniest thing happened to two of us as it happened. We both started on this uh, bungalow to clean it. We started from opposite ends. But we're both working round to one another and the two windows we finished on were bedroom windows. One was the mother's and one was the daughter's. And these two windows had a, these two bedrooms had a joining door. When I got on the daughter's, the mate got on the mother's and they were both undressed. And there was such a panic, the mother ran through the adjoining door <laughs> and the daughter ran round. So consequently we both copped it, we copped them both. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Thornley. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here on the Battersea circuit for the most fantastic racing event of 1968, the Grand Prix de Battersea. Three of the top drivers in the world fighting for the Dodgem Championship of the world. In number one, Sterling Moss. In number two, John Surtees. In number three, Denny Hume. Gentlemen, are you ready? On your marks, get set. Go. Thank you, Jonathan, and they're away. Uh, Denny Hume is in pole position, and it should be he, yes, who pulls away first on the inside and moves up towards that first right-hand bend. Going into the bend with a beautiful three-wheel drift, he could pull straight out of... No, he's turning back to give them a bump. Is it a bump? No, no, it's only a dodge, and it's cost Hume his lead. And Surtees is well away with Moss on his tail, and Moss has bumped Surtees. It's a wild bump, and Hume crashes into them both. Surtees still leading, now Moss... Drawing up base shunted Hume now. What a bumper Sterling is. And there we have it. Oh yes, they're out in a bunch now. Hume behind Sir Easton in the lead. What's this? Hume in a spot above there, a sneaky touch from Sterling. Oh, coming out of his first left-hand bend, Denny Hume a bit of bother with a slippery clutch there, I'd say. And we should be able to see from the board as they move to the pits that the position is unchanged. Yes. The changeover affected without difficulty. Hume and Moss are away, but where's Surtees? Could he have spun off on that bend? Good heavens, 
Yes, no, there's his abandoned car. No, here he comes. He leaps in, flipping the throttle, and he's away. His car is sparking on all fuses now. Moss is trying to pull Hume back. They're locked together in the straight. Hume trying to struggle free, a neat bit of double declutching there, and he pulls ahead to take the lead. Now, oh, goodness me, he must have been bumped by Sterling. He's run into him now. Now he spins to hit him again. And it's anybody's race. My goodness, what a day for the sport. Bit of set to in the straight now. Anybody's race. It looks like Hume. Yes, Hume drawing away. Surtees gives Moss one for the road, and it's all over. Mr. Hume. I'm sorry, Mr. Moss, about that. I think it's a dead heat between Mr. Moss, between uh, <laughs> Mr. Hume and Mr. Surtees. Gentlemen, would you come over here a second? Very cunning, Mr. Surtees, how you came in on that, because really it was Mr. Hume's race, and if you hadn't come in on the inner circle, it would have been <laughs> yours. Uh, Jermaine will now give you <laughs> the wreath, if you can get it over both their heads, please, at the same time. No way, no. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll make it. Could we have a small <laughs> consolation prize for the other co-winner? And a, a <laughs> consolation prize for the loser of doing four laps in the time that the others took to do five. All right, boys. All right, get ready. On your mark. <laughs> and don't forget, friends, he owes his success to Everett's homemade engine oil, which he pours on his cornflakes every morning. And now, nice song time. And this time, it's Eddie Cantor. Thank you for your cordial invitation, Mrs. Jones. But with nightclub life, we're through. Non-essential spending brings inflation, Mrs. Jones. So here's what we're planning to do. We're staying home tonight, my baby and me. Doing the patriotic thing. I've got my income tax return to hurdle. And she'll be saving mileage on her girdle. Don't want to roam tonight. We're snug as can be. Hoping the phone will never ring. The landlord never told us when we moved in this flat that you can use the fireside for more than a chat. We're staying home tonight, my baby and me. Doing the patriotic thing. We're staying home tonight, baby and me. Having a patriotic time. It's not that mommy doesn't trust her poppy. It's just that we don't trust our old jalopy. Don't want to roam tonight. We're snug as can be. Being alone is just a blind. While I sit in my slippers and munch a piece of fruit, she'll iron out the wrinkles in my victory suit. We're staying home tonight, my baby and me. Having a patriotic time. We'll play a game of rummy. It's cheaper than the Ritz. The winner wins a kiss that's just in case of a blitz. We're staying home tonight, my baby and me, having a patriotic time. A coffee could be sweeter, but I'm not in the dumps, cause every time she hugs me, it's like two extra lumps. We're staying home tonight, baby and me, having a patriotic time. What, only one bow? They love me. <laughs> and now here's that world famous lion tamer, Clement Merck. We've asked him along to tame a wild animal for us. Jonathan Jasper, our wild mouse. He's gonna take him away for a week and tame him. <laughs> and next week he'll be back to show us the tricks he's taught it. Now Harris, nice time's pet elephant, has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you. If you live in Grafton Square, Clapham, London SW4, look out of your window at this very moment and you will find a real elephant out there for you to ride on. If you live near, come too. He'll only be there for about an hour, so hurry. And now we're all going for a ride on Harris. Trot. Hey, yeah, let me on. Now there's a famous talky queen She looks a flapper on the screen She's more like 80 than 18 When I'm cleaning windows She pulls her hair all down behind Then pulls down her, never mind And after that pulls down the blind When I'm cleaning windows In my 
my profession I'll work hard but I'll never stop I'll climb this blinking ladder till I get right to the top at eight o'clock a girl she wakes at five past eight a bath she takes at ten past eight my ladder breaks when I'm cleaning windows Press conference, P459, take two. ended, as it always does, with the singing of Auld Lang Syne. The event was the 96th Annual Conference of the Trade Union Congress. For me, though, the high spot came yesterday when, during a discussion on the famous case of Rooks versus Barnard, the General Secretary, George Woodcock, seemed to me to lay down a bargaining counter for any government to pick up an offer for an inquiry into trade unions. Well, George Woodcock is here now. And in the studio, too, 